Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk about Peter Lynch, the legendary fund manager who ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund. We discuss Lynch's market beating record and offer up some lesser known facts about Lynch and his approach to investing. Lynch was known as popularizing the buy what you know investment philosophy, and Lynch strongly advocated knowing the story behind each stock you own. But what was also important to Lynch was looking at the fundamentals, things like the earnings growth rate, the peg ratio, and other meaningful investment criteria that can help determine the fundamental attractiveness of a company and a stock. We discuss these criteria and how we've implemented the model based on Lynch's book in the Validia system. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this discussion on Peter Lynch. Oh, and just one more thing. For those of you who follow our blog, The Guru Investor, we wanted to let you know that we've launched a new podcast where we read our original articles each week and Jack and I discuss the best articles we found for our blog from other sources we follow. The podcast is called The Lydia's Guru Investor Podcast and you can subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube via the Validia channel. Thanks for checking it out. All right, today we're going to talk about Peter Lynch and the strategy um, that we run based on the methodology he outlined in his best-selling book, One Up on Wall Street. But before we actually get into the model and the quantitative method that, that we extracted from the book, let's just talk a little bit more about Peter Lynch, his track record, sort of his background, who he is when he was uh, running uh, Fidelity Magellan Fund. So Lynch joined Fidelity in 1969, and um, over what was basically an eight-year period, he had many different roles at Fidelity, but he eventually became research director. And then in 1977, he took over as portfolio manager of the Fidelity Magellan Fund. It actually was the first fund that Lynch had ever managed, um, the first and only fund Lynch had ever managed. When Lynch um, took over running Magellan, um, it was basically a $20 million fund. And it seems like it was basically in place um, mostly for the Johnson family, which is the family that owns Fidelity. It was kind of like a private family investment vehicle. Um, and that plays into something I'll, I'll kind of talk about in a minute. But so Lynch started running it in 1977. By the time he retired in 1990, um, it had $14 billion, uh, in assets. So it went from $20 million when he first took over to $14 billion in assets. And Lynch probably has one of the best mutual fund track records of all time, for his full tenure from 77 to 1990, he uh, had compounded out at 29.2% versus 15.8% uh, for the overall market. So just to put that into perspective, a $10,000 investment in Magellan would have been worth about $280,000 um, at the end of Lynch's run. Um, and according to a Wall Street Journal article I read, that was from 2015, it said when Lynch ran uh, Magellan, one of every 100 Americans was invested in it. So it just goes to show how popular Magellan was at the time. Now, there's probably a few things worth pointing out that some people um, may not know. The first is that, as I mentioned, the fund actually wasn't open to the public until 1981. So the first few years of Lynch's track record, you know, most investors wouldn't have been able to basically achieve because they wouldn't have access to the fund. And the second point, and this is something I think we've talked about in a couple other podcasts, not with Lynch's track record, and this doesn't take anything away from the phenomenal track record he had, but, and this is from Spencer Jacobs' book. Uh, Spencer Jacob is a, a Wall Street Journal uh, writer, and he wrote a book a few years ago. And in it, he wrote, I'll just read this, uh, during his tenure, Lynch trounced the, the market overall and beat, beat it in most years, racking up a 29% annualized return. But Lynch himself pointed out the fly in the ointment. He calculated that the average investor in his fund made only around 7% during the same period. He would have had, he, when he would have a setback, for example, the money would flow out of the fund through redemptions. And when it got back on track, the money would flow back in. And thus, many would have missed the recovery. And so it's kind of a similar story to, you know, another mutual fund, um, Ken Hebner's CGM Focus Fund, which was one of the best performing funds from 2000 to 2009, um, that had a phenomenal track record. But the average investor actually lost money because they would sort of chase the performance when it did well. And then they would, you know, when the, when the, when the fund took a hit or when the market corrected, they would move out. And so that sort of 
bad behavior resulted in pretty poor performance. And it was true with Fidelity, Magellan. It was true with Hebner's Fund. And it kind of still continues to happen um, in this day and age. But anyway, so Lynch actually retired when he was 46. So he went out at the top of his game. Um, not many money ma mo not many money managers actually do that. Um, and I would say besides Buffett, Lynch is probably the last superstar um, sort of fun. I don't know if you agree with this, Jack, but Lynch is probably like you know, in terms of superstar fund managers, you know, there's not very many of those around. And Lynch, when you think about those, who would you say is like the star fund manager? You know, Peter Lynch is still sort of on the top of many investors' minds because I don't think there are a lot of superstar fund managers anymore in, in this day and age. Yeah, no, if you, if you look at, like, I mean, there are definitely some, maybe some star hedge fund managers these days, but, you know, try to name some mutual fund managers that are star managers that are still managing funds today. I mean, Bill Miller, maybe, um, some other guys as well, but there, there's not, you know, that, that whole star manager, you know, the, the era of the star manager is probably coming to an end here. So you're right. I mean, Lynch was one of the, one of the few who's been able to do this long term, but also th these types of guys are getting fewer and farther between, you know, as we move forward here. One of the things that was interesting to me about Lynch, and you probably know more about this than I did, is, you know, he typically held what thousands of stocks in Magellan at any given time. Yeah, I think at, yeah, I think at one point he held as many as fourteen hundred stocks. Yeah, so just just if you just think about that, I mean, one of the common characteristics you see of all these guys who beat the market over really long periods is they run focused portfolios. And what's really unique about him is he didn't do that. You know, to try to produce, I mean, I think he produced something like eight percent a year in alpha, um, which we'll get to in a second in in the Magellan fund, and he did it by owning a thousand plus stocks. I mean, that, that is incredibly unique and incredibly hard to do. Um, you know, the Buffets of the world and, and other guys like that, you know, all believe in running these focused portfolios where they get their best ideas in there. Lynch to do it on such a diversified group of stocks is really impressive. Yes. And, and supposedly he knew like of all, all those stocks in his portfolio, he knew the story. And that was his whole thing, you know, knowing the story behind each of the names that you're buying. And Lynch could like rattle off you know, what the company did, what its growth, pro growth prospects were, its product line, all that kind of stuff. So he was very intimate with all the stocks that he um, owned. Just before we get into the performance, you know, Lynch is still around and out there. He, um, I think he's, uh, he still has a role at Fidelity. Um, he might be like vice chairman or something like that. I don't know his exact title, but um, just as recently as late 2019, he did a Barron's interview, uh, which I, really enjoyed. And, you know, he, he kind of continues to advocate. I, I thought the timing of it was just interesting because he was in the interview, he was talking about how investors should approach stock selection, knowing the story behind the stocks, looking at the fundamentals, taking a long-term view, all the stuff that we know Peter Lynch for, but he was sort of like, you know, advocating for the individual investor, like don't give up on, you know, picking individual stocks and he was, he's always been an advocate for that. And what, you know, back that this was pre pandemic, you know, like individual stock picking was kind of just dying because it was, it just wasn't, you know, looked at as a, as a, people still do it a, a lot, but obviously with the pandemic, it, it really like accelerated and you had this boom in online trading. So I just felt like the timing of that article was interesting because we know what's happened since the shutdown. I mean, Online trading, Robinhood, brokerage accounts. I mean, they've gone through the roof and people are trading like, like crazy. And I, that's not the type. I'm not saying that that's a type of trading Lynch would advocate. I'm just saying that it was interesting that he was sort of out there publicly saying, you know, individual investors should still be picking individual stocks, stocks they know, stocks that they, um, you know, they're companies that they're buying products with day in and day out. Those are the types of companies. That's where you want to start when you're picking individual stocks and you know, we know what's happened. It's kind of gone parabolic here with the amount of trading going on. So what's interesting about him. And I think you can probably comment on this better than I can, but sometimes people misunderstand him because they misunderstand this whole buy what you know thing. They thought, you know, he would just go to the mall or something. He would see a store he likes and he would put it in Magellan's fund. And that wasn't the, that was the beginning of the process, not the entire process. I mean, Lynch would analyze the companies. He would dig into what they're doing and you know, he would do a lot more than just, Oh, I, I know this brand or I use this brand or I like this brand. So I'm going to buy the stock. Um, you may have more comments on it than me, but I, I think that's a common misconception about, about Lynch in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, no, you're exactly right. I mean, that's people at a high level. It's like, buy what you know, it's like, you know, you don't want to go too far outside your circle of competence in terms of buying a stock that you don't understand what the underlying business is. Like in that Barron's interview, he said, you know, if you can't explain to your mother in 30 seconds, you know, what the company does, you probably have no business buying it. But to your point, you know, there was 
a whole set. And this is where, you know, where what, what we do with our models is the whole sort of fundamental bottoms up analysis of the financials and the valuation and the growth rates. And he would even go so far as to, he didn't really like analyst uh, earnings growth rates, but you know, he would try to look at the growth potential of a company and, um, you know, try, tr tr try to use that in his um, analysis. So no, you're right. And a lot of people just kind of think about Lynch and buy what you know, and it's obviously much, much more than that. Um, one of the things that, uh, I know you wanted to sort of comment on is some of the research and the data in that AQR paper, that superstar, superstar uh, investor research paper they put out. Yeah, you know, taking a step back of, we run 22 strategies on Validia, and this is probably the strategy where the quantitative version of the strategy is furthest from the actual person. And that's not because we haven't done what we've done with every one of our strategies. I mean, this is taken exactly from one up on Wall Street, the exact criteria he put in there. But the, the way Lynch managed money in the real world is, you know, is partially uses these fundamental criteria, but also is in a lot of ways very different. And and that's what AQR sort of got at in this in this paper. They they wrote this paper, Superstar Investors, where they went back after the fact and tried to look at historically successful investors and said, you know, can we break down their success using factors? And for people like Buffett or Bill Gross, you know, they, they were able to much more successfully use individual factors to say, you know, we can explain their track record using these factors. With Lynch, they had a very hard time doing it because he did so many different things. I'll read a little bit from the paper to, you know, to explain what, where they where they were coming from with this. It says uh, part of Magellan's outperformance seems to be from taking ri more risk than the market and harvesting small cap and momentum premiums. We also found some exposure to the value premium, but smaller in magnitude. Although exposure to the quality premium is not statistically significant, we note that even when applied systematically, quality is among the most heterogeneous investment styles and thus may be harder to measure. And then later in the paper, they say, however, despite the plethora of factors examined here, the headline from this analysis might be that Magellan still posted an 8% alpha on average each year after 13 years. Capping it off, Lynch is famous for the rare feat of having left at the top. His successors at Magellan have had a much more typical track record. In the 13 years following Lynch's departure, Magellan's alpha relative to the equity market factor has been indistinguishable from zero. So, you know, there's two important points here. One is Lynch produced an enormous amount of alpha. Um, and second, you can't really explain it with any particular, you know, I, I listed almost every factor that exists in some way in there, small cap, quality, momentum, you know, value, there, there's no, they weren't able to explain his performance like they were able to explain a lot of the other managers they looked at in the paper. Yeah, one of the things that um, Lynch wrote about in the book is he really had like a number of different categories, and we'll kind of get into this, but, you know, he would look at slow growers, stalwarts fast growers, cyclicals, turnaround, and what he would call like asset opportunities, which were like some like a business that had hidden, hidden assets that the market wasn't, you know, valuing. So I think he was, you know, very wide ranging and he was kind of like a go anywhere investor. I mean, in some ways I'd be interested. I, I never looked at this, but I, he, he, I wonder where he would have fit on the Morningstar style and size box with that many. He probably would have been like a mid cap Blend. value and growth type. Yeah, like fund, a blend almost, probably a mid-cap blend or something like that. You know, which makes sense. I mean, a growth, because we, you know, we would consider his strategy a growth at a reasonable price type of strategy um, or a GARP type strategy. So he probably would have fit somewhere in there, but, you know, he would go anywhere. He just wasn't going to be constrained to, you know, large cap value or small cap growth or, or something like that. So, um so do you want to, Jack, sort of talk through, you want to get into the model in some detail now? We can talk about how we've captured it quantitatively. Sure, yeah. And one, one of the interesting things about Lynch, and you, you touched on this, is you know, he, he started by categorizing companies based on their growth rates. And so he had slow growers, he had stalwarts, and he had fast growers. And I think that's an interesting thing to do because, and, and you see this with some of our other strategies, the types of criteria you might apply to a fast growing company are different than the types of criteria you might ap apply to a company that's just growing, you know, trotting, you know, going along at 5% a year. And so I think it's an interesting way to do it to say, all right, let's first categorize these companies based on how they're growing. And then let's apply a series of criteria, you know, to determine whether it's an attractive stock. Um, and with Lynch, as most people know him for, you know, he, he was very, he popularized the peg ratio. And so he was looking at the price to earnings relative to the growth rate. And that can be a very difficult thing to calculate. We won't go into all the details here, but there are a lot of different PE ratios a stock has, the forward PE, the trailing PE, the average PE, you know, and there's also a lot of growth rates, the five-year growth rate, the three-year growth rate, the analyst expected future growth rate. And 
you know, so the, the P the peg ratio is something when you see it on websites, you'll see so many different peg ratios for the same exact stock because there's just so many different ways to do it. You know, in, in our case, what we like to do is we, we take a lot of these growth rates and we average them together. You know, we're trying to get at what is the average growth over time. And so we use the current PE and we average that, you know, we use that relative to an average growth rate over time. But what Lynch was looking for is, you know, if you could get less than 0.5 on the peg ratio, that was really attractive. If you get less than one, that was attractive. Um, you know, both of which are, are very hard to find these days because obviously the market is, has gone up a lot. But that was his starting point was start with the peg ratio and see, you know, where you are with your valuation relative to your growth. And then he looked at a lot of other things as well. Um, so if, if we use his, his stalwarts as an example, stalwarts were companies growing between 10 and 20 percent. Um, he, he looked at the he wanted positive EPS. He wanted low total debt to equity. Um, he wanted a high return on assets. Um, and then he had some bonus criteria. You know, if the free cash flow to price was greater than 35%, or if the net cash to price was greater than 30%, you would get some bonus uh, criteria. So that's that's in general what he looked at. Um, and then, you know, just to, just to highlight one other area too, I thought that was interesting with him is his fast growers, which are growing greater than 20%. One of the things he did there, and, and this gets back to trying to you know, evaluate companies differently depending on the type of company they are, is he would cap the amount of EPS growth he would allow. So, you know, he was looking for EPS growth in the 20 to 50% range, but when it got above 50%, he was, you know, less likely to buy the stock. He would consider that a negative. And, you know, you see, you see that a lot with growth companies is they, if they're growing at such rapid rates and the market is valuing them as if they're growing at such rapid rates, the, that growth is inevitably going to decline. And so he wasn't buying companies where the growth rate was too high and he didn't feel like it was sustainable. Yeah, and just one thing on the peg ratio, like let's just kind of put some numbers to it. If you have a company that has a PE of 10 or a stock that has a PE of 10 um, and they have an earnings growth rate of 20, that would equate to a peg ratio of 0.5. So, you know, that's what Lynch was looking for. He was looking for companies that were reasonably priced for using like the Staller one uh, or even fast growers, companies that were reasonably, reasonably pr priced um, but that had, you know, strong, um, earnings growth rates. And that's, that's sort of the formula of how you would, um, back into that. Um, Lynch was also, I think he, you know, he's one of those, um, there's a story where, uh, he, he wrote, it was, uh, from, from his book, but one night he got a call from, um, Warren Buffett and Buffett had read the book and, um, the quote was something along the lines like, you don't want to cut your flowers to water your weeds. And what Lynch was saying there, and what, where I'm going to relate it to is, you know, Lynch is often no, known for trying to find companies that were like multi-bagger. So if you got a five, five bagger or a 10 bagger, companies that had the potential because they were fast growers, they were growing, they had the sustainable growth. You could see, you know, make five times on your money over the very long term. Um, if you got it right. And so what was, what's cool about that story is, you know, Buffett called Lynch, asked him if he could use that quote for one of his, um, annual letters, Berkshire's annual letters and, and, uh, Lynch obviously agreed to it. Um, so that's kind of a neat, neat little, neat little story there. I think one of the things that Lynch also sort of advocated very heavily is that, you know, investors sort of stay in the game. And I think this past year, you know, it was, kind of a good example, you know, of, of where staying in the game and staying invested in stocks while difficult and scary and hard, especially at the depths of the uh, pandemic, you know, those investors that did that were rewarded. And so, you know, Lynch oftentimes wasn't like building cash positions, infidelities, mutual funds and stuff. He, he sort of advocated, if you're going to sell a stock, you're going to sell it and you're going to move into, you know, something that looks even better to maintain that long-term, you know, market exposure and get the benefit of, of stocks over time. Yeah. And you know, you see, you, these are common things you see with a lot of these gurus, you know, they, they talk about, you know, don't, don't time the market, you know, stay within your circle of competence. I mean, those are, those are things Buffett could have said just as easily as Lynch. And, you know, we see that in common with all the, you know, the investors we've tracked over time is there, there's certain common things that all of these guys say, because they're, they're so key to successful investing. One of the things just uh, before we wrap up here, you know, it is interesting. There's like in the Lynch portfolio right now, there's like, kind of a lot of financials, which I think could be good. And there's kind of a lot of home builders, which home builders have been on a tear. So it's interesting that sometimes these strategies tend to sort of pick up on different, you know, specific areas of the market. It's, um, 
and, you know, find those opportunities um, and kind of get focused in on a specific industry or sector. That's just something I'm noticing as I'm looking at the Lynch, I'm looking at the 20 stock um, portfolio we run based on his methodology. And it's got uh, a nice level of home builders and some, some financials in there. Yeah, you know, and, and just to, to conclude, you know, he is really, like I said at the beginning, he's probably the hardest guy to quantify of everyone we've done. And, you know, this is something we say about all our strategies all the time is our goal here is not to automate what Peter Lynch would have done or automate what Warren Buffett would have done. You know, our goal is inside the published research of these guys, there is a quantifiable strategy that you can apply in an emotion-free way and, you know, select fundamentally sound stocks. And, you know, that, that's what we're trying to do with Lynch. And, you know, his, his strategy gets at really the core of the way you should probably value companies, which is he's looking at what is the valuation of the company. And then he's looking at is, you know, what is the rate the company is growing at? And then trying to relate those things together and saying, am I getting a bargain with what I'm paying relative to what the growth rate is? And then you apply other things on top of that, like low debt and things like that to, you know, try to look at the balance sheet as well. So I, I think it's an interesting strategy in that it really gets at the, you know, the proper way to value a company. Great. Oh, that's a good way to wrap it up. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this discussion. We will see you next time. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.